I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon. And on this edition, we're going to be looking back at Arsenal's League Cup exit. The Gunners, of course, crashing out in the third round at the hands of Roberto De Zerbi's Brighton and Hove Albion. A disappointing night at Emirates Stadium. There's no way of getting around that. There's no way of packaging this up into a positive. But we can discuss whether or not it's the end of the world. Well, no, look, we're not even going to discuss that because it's not the end of the world. But there is quite a bit of mixed feeling on social media from Arsenal fans. I've I've spoken with a few people today. I've exchanged some tweets with Sophie from the Highbury squad. Make sure you check out the Highbury squad, by the way, who feels quite strongly about the fact that Arsenal seem to just throw this competition away, that it was an opportunity for Arsenal to go on and get silverware. And, and if you win silverware at the start of a journey like this with a young group of players, that can have a really positive knock-on effect going forward. I get that. But in the grand scheme of things, am I all that fussed? I mean, does it matter that Arsenal have gone out of the League Cup at this stage? If I'm being completely honest, I don't care. Um, I really, really don't. Look, obviously, I'd have preferred to win. Obviously, I'd have preferred to see my team put Brighton to bed, to see some of the fringe players really thrive and really perform because of late. They haven't always done that when the opportunities have come along, and that's been largely in the Europa League. I, I I don't really feel too strongly about this. I have to be honest. So I can't sit here and pretend I'm outraged about the fact that we're out. But there are things that you can take away from that game, learns from that game that I look at. And I think, yeah, this kind of re-emphasizes some of the points that we've made previously, as opposed to told us anything really new about where this group are at, about what this squad is capable of, about the depth or lack of that we have at our disposal. So, I mean, I be guess the best place to start is at the very beginning, you know, the, the team selection. Mikel Arteta made 10 changes to the side that won at Stamford Bridge. Now, we were talking on, on BBC Radio London last night ahead of the game, sort of around about an hour and a half before kickoff. So the team news hadn't dropped yet. And we were talking about where this ranks in Arsenal's priority list. How high up the list would you put the League Cup? How high up the list would you put... The domestic cups full stop. And my response, I think, surprised a few people because I said that this is right at the bottom. If you had to rank the four competitions that we're in this season, right? So Premier League, Europa League, FA Cup, Carabao Cup. This is undoubtedly at the bottom. No question about that in my mind. Now, look, there's a lot of Arsenal fans out there that will say we haven't won this competition. It will be 30 years if we don't win it this time around. 30 years since we last won it. Arsene Wenger never won it. I, as a fan, was three years old when Arsenal last won it. I don't remember Arsenal winning it. So from a personal perspective, yeah, this is one on my list. This is one that I want to tick off. This is one that I want to see the Gunners win. But as I say, am I going to lose sleep over it? No, I'm not. Um, am I going to sit here and be outraged about it in the days to come? No. You know, go to Wolves at the weekend, put in a good performance, get the desired result, and nobody talks about this ever again. You know, last season we went to the semi-finals of this competition and we were beaten by Liverpool, of course, over those two legs. But last season we didn't have European football. So Mikel Arteta, I think, probably felt that it was OK to, you know, use the squad uh, up until a certain point. And then he started to take it a little bit more seriously later on because it was an opportunity to get silverware. But as I said to you guys last season, when everybody was upset about the fact that Liverpool had beaten us over a couple of legs, it still doesn't offer us a route back to where we want to be. Yeah, you win the cup, great. You have a nice day out at Wembley. You lift the trophy. It's another trophy on Mikel Arteta's CV. I totally get that, totally understand that. And obviously you prefer to win them than not win them. But at the start of the season, when Mikel Arteta, Edu, Vinay, the Cronkies, whoever, sat around the table and discussed where they wanted to be at the end of the season, what the objectives were, what the aims were, you can bet that the first priority and the top objective would have been to get this club back in the Champions League. And no matter how much you enjoy a day out at Wembley, the Carabao Cup does not offer us that. The FA Cup does not offer us that. 
Hence why they have to be third and fourth in the pecking order. They have to be third and fourth in terms of the list of priorities because they don't aid us in getting to where it is that we want to get to. And that's that's the black and white of it. That's the the simple fact. And I know a lot of people find that difficult to accept and I understand. Nobody wants their team to lose. I didn't. I was annoyed last night when I was covering the game. I was annoyed when Brighton scored the first, second and third. I was annoyed with some of the defending. I was annoyed with some of the uh, the play in the final third. I was annoyed with the way I didn't think we controlled the midfield well enough. There were a lot of things that irritated me and aggravated me. And as I said right at the top of the show, there were a lot of things that I already thought that I come away now totally convinced of. And we'll get on to individual players in a minute because I think it's worth discussing some of the performances we saw last night. But does this justify a huge reaction, a huge meltdown? You know, there's people out there sort of questioning the decision to pick the team that Mikel Arteta did. Could you argue that it was a little bit disrespectful to Brighton, myself and Aaron Paul on, on BBC Radio London while having this conversation last night? Could you accuse Mikel Arteta of disrespecting Brighton? You've got to remember that Brighton made eight changes as well, right? So this was not Arsenal turning up, you know, disrespecting the Brighton side that were all over this game and all over this competition and were all in on it, who played their first 11 and then battered us. That That's not what happened. What happened was both teams made a lot of changes. There's a huge risk when you make a lot of changes that you affect the continuity, you affect the momentum, you affect, you know, the, the cohesion of your side. And I think there's a lot of relationships in this makeshift Arsenal team that we saw last night that aren't there and probably will never be there. You've got different types of players to the ones that normally play, playing in key positions. For example, Mohamed Elneny. You constantly saw him last night drop into that pocket in between the two centre-backs. Carl Hine, obviously new in the side, feels like he's got to carry out the manager's instructions to a tee, plays the ball into him at every opportunity. And on numerous occasions, it put us into danger and into trouble. And so you think about what would happen if that was Ramsdale or if it was... Thomas Partey in El Nenny's position. And what would actually happen is Partey wouldn't drop into that space every single time. He'd understand when the right time to do so is and when it's the right time to do something else. Equally, Aaron Ramsdale has the ability to go long and has the ability to break lines and, and pick out other players as opposed to just always looking to hit that base of the midfield. And what you get when you get a group of players that are on the fringes coming in is a, a desperation to impress the manager and almost the fear of trusting themselves, a fear of getting it wrong, a fear of not executing whatever it is they've been asked to execute in exactly the way that the boss wants. And then they become robots. And you saw that last night with a number of players. Again, we'll come on to the individuals in a minute. But just let me know, you know, how are you feeling, generally speaking, about the fact that Arsenal are out of the League Cup at the third round stage? I did put a poll um, up in the chat right at the start. And the question was, should Arsenal have taken the League Cup more seriously in terms of the team selection? 21% uh, of you said yes, and 79% of you said no. So the general consensus or the, the majority consensus is that actually Arsenal were right to make the changes. Now, I've got to be honest with you. I was surprised that he rotated so drastically. I expected to see a rotation similar to the type that we've seen in the Europa League, whereby you've got three or four of your big players in the side just to give you that bit of insurance, just to give you that bit of quality. And then, you know, hopefully you get yourself into a commanding position and you can take them off later in the game. But instead, Mikel Arteta completely changed it. With the exception, as I say, of William Saliba, everybody changed. And you run through that team, Carl Hine making his debut. You know, you look at right back Cedric Suarez. We all know what we're going to get from Cedric Suarez. Left back was Kieran Tierney. Centre backs were Saliba and Holding. Holding another one that we know all about. Then you move into the midfield and you've got El Nenny. You've got Lakonga. You've got Vieira. And then you look into the forward line and you're talking Marquinhos, Nelson and Nketiah. That team, where would it finish in the Premier League? I don't even think it finishes mid-table. Genuinely, I don't. So why are people shocked and surprised when we come up against Premier League opposition, decent Premier League opposition as well, and get beat? You shouldn't be surprised. What it does is it highlights and shines a light on the fact that this squad 
is nowhere near well equipped enough to compete on multiple fronts. And what we've had to do is try and find the balance in the Europa League to navigate our way through the group stages. And that worked okay. We were quite fortunate in that people didn't pick up too many serious injuries and we were able to get through it unscathed in the end. But when you start adding a third competition into the mix and a fourth competition into the mix, then this is what happens. And so am I accepting of it? Am I happy about it? No, I'm not. I'm not happy about it. How can I be happy? My team's lost. This is a club that I adore and love. How can I be happy that they're out of a competition? I'm not happy, but I'm trying to think what the right word is here. I'm not happy, but I am. I'm OK. I'm over it, if that makes sense already. That's how I feel genuinely. Uh, let's go over to the chat. Let's say a few hellos. Uh, Daniel, Steve, Harvey, uh, Mark, Paul. Um, who else we've got? Matt. Uh, Ash, uh, Tom, we've got uh, Ben Excel, we've got uh, Christopher, we've got Kai, um, lots of you, lots of you. Uh, let's um, let's take some of your comments. Let's get what you guys are thinking on this as well. Uh, Mark says, I'm more disappointed for or with the second string of players who won't get much game time now. Yeah, that's how I feel about it as well. Uh, Ash says, if there was one first team injury, Arteta would have got killed. Not literally, but I know what you mean. And, and you're probably right. Uh, Zed Tom says, at least it isn't as bad as Spurs losing despite going with the strongest team they could. Yeah, look, it was an awful night for London clubs, wasn't it? Everyone went out. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, Mark goes on to say, maybe we do have bigger fish to fry, but we let the seagulls swoop down and steal our sardines. I love that. Brilliant. Uh, Ash goes on to say, all it shows is the depth issues. The next step of the project is raising the floor of the squad. I agree. Uh, Steve says, it's just wrong for supporters to want their team to lose a football match. After saying that, the League Cup is bottom of priorities this season. So I'm not too upset. Yeah, look, nobody's saying that they want their team to lose. Well, I'm certainly not saying that. It's one of those where if you win, you're happy. Great. You know, it gives confidence to those players on the peripheries. It gives confidence to those players knocking on the door, hoping desperately to force their way into the starting Premier League 11. But at the same time, if you do get beat, you can take it. You can process it. I mean, honestly, I'm not upset. Not in the slightest. Uh, what else have we got? Um, Christopher says, could not care less about this result. The competition is totally redundant anyway, shouldn't even exist. Uh, Ash says, Harry, were you surprised that Mikel was so open about the squad being short? It's not normally like that. You know, we'll touch on his uh, presser comments a little bit later on because there were a couple of points. I just wanted to pick up on that. But let's go through then some of the individual performances. Actually, before we do that, sorry, I haven't like written a running order today. I'm all over the place, which is why I keep jumping back and forth from different topics. My apologies, how very unprofessional of me. But let's talk a little bit about the approach to the game then. Because having said that this is bottom of the list of priorities, having said that this is not a competition I'm too fussed about, having said that, you know, it could be a bit of a blessing in disguise given the fixture pileup that we can expect post-World Cup and given that we're going to come out of the back of the World Cup not really knowing how some of our players are going to be doing, we're not really going to know where some of them are at in terms of their fitness. Are some of them going to have difficult times from a mental standpoint? Is that is there going to be a World Cup hangover? A lot of people are talking about players maybe not trying so hard in the final weeks, maybe just backing off a little bit, maybe being a little bit hesitant when it comes to certain challenges that could potentially lead to World Cup missing injuries. Maybe there is an element of that. But at the same time, and by that same token, is there going to be a bit of a hangover on the other side? There might be. Nobody knows because this doesn't happen normally. And so you can't plan for it either way. You know, you, you just have to kind of do the best you can up until the break and then just hope that you can reset and restart with the least disruption possible when the World Cup finishes and everybody returns back to their clubs. But having taken the decision that this was obviously not a priority, i.e. picking the team that he did, i.e. picking a front line that didn't have any of the first choice players in there, i.e. making 10 changes to the side that won in the Premier League at the weekend. 
I was then surprised to see Mikel Arteta trying to turn it around by bringing on some of the big boys once we found ourselves behind. I mean, by the end of the game, Jesus was on, Martinelli was on, Xhaka was on. Was Odegaard on as well? I think he was. And uh, Gabriel was on. And you're kind of looking at it and you're going, uh, Zinchenko too. You're kind of looking at it and you're going, well, did you care or did you not care? Because if you cared, you'd have picked a stronger team. Surely, if you don't care, then given the likelihood of us turning this around and the fact that it's pretty much at zero because we played poorly all night, you're probably thinking, why am I going to my bench then? Why am I going to take any risk whatsoever with these players? The tie's done. That's how I would have looked at it. So I'm I'm struggling to understand whether Mikel Arteta cared, but just misjudged it really badly and then tried to salvage it later on. Or if he doesn't care and then just felt like he had to show some willingness for the fans that had paid their money to turn up some willingness to try and get themselves back in the game. And that's why he made those changes. He weighed up the risk and the reward. The risk, obviously, given some of them only played 10, 15 minutes, was not very high. And the reward is that those walking away from Emirates Stadium on the night would at least be able to think, yeah, well, you know, at least he tried. At least he turned to the bench and he tried to to change it. I don't really know. I can't quite work out what his... Uh, what his... um what his plan was, essentially, going into the night. Did he get it horribly wrong? Did he show a lack of respect to Brighton and Hove Albion? You could argue that as well. But let's run through the, the team then. Let's start with uh, Carl Hein. Look, given his debut, handed his debut, he is a very promising young goalkeeper. He's played 16 times for the Estonian national team. He's no mug, OK? He came into the picture last night. I think a lot of people were surprised to see him start. And unfortunately for him, after 26, 27 minutes, he made a mistake. And that mistake is something that I think obviously clouds people's judgment of him. I think it's a mistake that can happen to any goalkeeper. What I mean by that is it's not a mistake in terms of his judgment. He hasn't made a bad decision, in my opinion, in the from the outset anyway. He hasn't done something really silly. What's happened is he's gone to move towards a ball that he's the favourite to get to, really, and he slips. And once he slips, it's about the decision he makes after that, because then he decides to commit himself to try and put right the slip. And then he ends up bringing down Danny Welbeck and Brighton score. And that's that. And all of a sudden, Carl Hines having a shaky night. He's a little bit down in the dumps. He's a little bit downbeat. This was his big night, his first team debut. And it's gone up in smoke. That was unfortunate. That is something that if he can get past it, which I'm sure he will, because he's got plenty of support and good people around him, could help him in the future. You learn from those moments, right? Most people remember their mistakes. Most people use their mistakes to, to fuel themselves going forward. And that feeling that you get from a mistake is often enough to give you the motivation you need to just be that little bit more concentrated in the key moments so as to not commit the same mistake again, so as to not find yourself in that situation and feeling in that way at a later date. So I'm not worried about Carl Hines' mistake. Honestly, I'm not. A lot of people were like, oh, here we go. I saw, you know, obviously his name's Carl Hines, Hines the baked bean brand. I saw people online calling him a tin of baked beans and God knows what else. Um, you know, just wanting to have a go, have a little bit of a laugh and all that. And he might be harmless, but it's just totally unnecessary. You know, he's our goalkeeper. He's a young goalkeeper. He's coming up through the ranks. Everybody at Arsenal Football Club, from people I speak to, thinks incredibly highly of him, myself included. And I'm not I'm not going to dwell on the mistake he made last night. I don't think it's that big a deal. You move into the heart of the defence. I thought Rob Holding was awful last night, honestly. Um I thought he gave the ball away stupidly when trying to progress it into midfield. Just isn't capable of doing that. I think he got tangled up in situations when trying to defend that he had no business being in. I don't think he gave Saliba the sufficient cover when he was trying to step that little bit further forward and break lines. I just, you watch Rob Holding and, you know, for all the criticism and stick that people had given Gabriel over the last few months, you just watch Rob Holding and you go, yep, that's why. Uh, Gabriel cannot be dropped. That's why Gabriel um, should be appreciated. Now, I know he can be dropped, um, you know, 
speaking honestly, you can obviously put Ben White in at centre-back. You can put Tommy Asu in at centre-back. But the point I'm trying to make here is that you don't appreciate what you've got at centre-back until you watch Rob Holding. He's a nice enough guy. He's a good character to have in and around the dressing room, clearly accepts and understands his bit part role and and he's a popular lad. And, and you can't deny that he cares. I mean, he scored a goal in the Europa League earlier this season at Emirates. I think it was against Bodo Glimp. And you could tell by his reaction how much it meant to him. So I don't have a problem with with Rob Holding, but it's clear the drop off is significant in a number of areas. And that was one where we really saw it last night. Cedric Suarez, I mean, he's OK. He gets up and down the right-hand side. He gets into the attacking positions. He's got a decent delivery on him and he always looks to put the ball into the box early. But you've got to stop, pause, wait a minute. Think about what you're doing, Cedric. You're getting the ball in a wide area and you're putting a lofted cross into the penalty area. Looking for Eddie and Ketia while Levi Colwell and Lewis Dunk are literally standing on the edge of their six-yard box willing you to do that because they know they can deal with it. They know they have the upper hand. So I just want to see a bit more a bit more, I don't know what the word is, like just just make better decisions when you get in those positions because we all know that he can get in those positions. We all know that he's actually got quite a bit of quality when he's got the ball at his feet. But defensively, he gets caught out. And unfortunately, I don't think he always makes the right decisions, as I say. On the other side, Kieran Tierney, I thought it was okay last night, but again, quite underwhelming. Um, I have to say that. I thought that Brighton's best play in the second half, came down their right-hand side for large periods. And obviously, that's the side that Kieran Tierney was responsible for. But, you know, I don't think he was particularly good and I don't think he was particularly bad. I don't think it was a very telling performance from Kieran Tierney either way. Saliba, you know, is William Saliba, does what he does and, and that's that. Moving into midfield, I mentioned El Nenny. I touched upon the fact that he just kept dropping into that hole. He just doesn't do it as well as Partey. He's not as smart with his movement as Partey. He is somebody that puts out fires. That's how I look at Mohamed Elneny. But the minute you ask him to be something more, something progressive, something that can set the tempo and rhythm of the football team, he struggles. And you can clearly see that. Lokonga, again, given an opportunity to play in that slightly more advanced role. And again, in my opinion, does not take it. He just does not take it. And he's been left out of the Belgian squad today. I expected that. I think most people did. So it's not really a big news story. Uh, in that sense. But you can just see this is a guy who, when he came in, put in some really good performances, appeared to be on a really upward trajectory, appeared to be moving towards a really high level. And it's just all gone wrong. And I don't know what it is. Is it a lack of confidence? Probably. How do you get that back in him outside of just picking him and playing him? But you can't play him every week now. You can't play him in the Premier League because he's not at the level required. And it's a problem. You know, you look at Fabio Vieira as well, big money signing in the summer, a player that I still think will come good, but you can't deny that his last few performances have been worrying. You can't deny that his last few performances have just raised some questions around his level and whether or not Arsenal were correct, right to go out and spend what they spent on him when there are other positions, obviously, that need addressing too. You then take it to the forward line, Marquinhos, had a relatively uneventful game again didn't have the impact he'd have liked, constantly looking to cut inside onto that left foot of his, as you'd expect, but just is almost too predictable at times. I think he needs a loan, Marquinhos. I don't think that I would do it right now because of how little cover Arsenal have in that area with Emil Smith-Rowe out injured. But that's something that we've got to be looking at in the future. And that's one of the positions that we need to be looking to address in January, of course, if possible. Reese Nelson, I thought, Played really well in spells. I thought at the start of the second half, he was excellent. And during a couple of periods in the first half, he was really effective too. Great work from him to set up in Ketia's goal, which was brilliantly taken, by the way. Um, but again, I just want to see that level of performance consistently over a 90-minute period or at least a 70-minute period. He was very in and out of the game. I accept that the team wasn't very good. I accept that there was a lack of service and a lack of support around him. But I just want to see that little bit more from him too. So then we take it on to Eddie and Ketia up front. Superb goal was against the run of play, I'd say. Arsenal receiving the ball in midfield with uh, Nelson. He drove forward. He laid it off to Nketiah to his left, who didn't even take a touch, just opened up his right foot and bent one beautifully uh, into the far corner, as I said it on the commentary, Thierry Henry style. And um, yeah, great stuff. 
you know, but outside of that, was he influential enough outside of that? Did he have a big enough impact? The first half performance was rubbish. It really was. And Brighton were, when they found themselves a goal down after what, 20 minutes, they would have felt incredibly unlucky. And they would have felt as if the whole world was against them because they had honestly been the better team. They'd had a couple of half decent efforts at goal. They'd worked some good spaces uh, Sarmiento from the left-hand side was a, a real thorn in our side. Um, and CISO as well was was causing us problems. Danny Welbeck's movement, you know, not the most clinical finisher Danny Welbeck never has been, but certainly up there in terms of his movement and the work rate that he, you know, shows and displays every single time he takes to the field. And then obviously Arsenal get the goal through Enketia and, and then seven minutes later, Brighton win the penalty off the back of Carl Hines' mistake. And you sit there and you go, OK, no need to panic. This is kind of what we deserve. Brighton do deserve to be on level terms. We've not played very well. It can only get better in the second half. And teams go in at the break and Mikel Arteta says what he says and does what he does. And when Arsenal come out, they come out with a new intensity, with a new purpose, with a new drive, with a new tempo about their game. They look like a completely different animal. And I, and I turn around to my colleague and I said, yeah, you know what? This, this, this bodes well. Arsenal look like they have been shaken up at halftime and really desperately want to put on a display and get themselves over the line here. These players, the Vieiras, the Inquietias, the Marquinhoses, the Nelsons, these guys have got a point to prove. So here they are trying to do that and let's all get behind them. And the volume inside the stadium went up and you think that Arsenal are going to go on to win it. There's a couple of opportunities. Inquietias shot was just tipped onto the post. Uh, there was a really good chance for Sambi Lekonga that he put wide. And you're thinking, OK, it's just a matter of time. And then Brighton go down the other end and get that second goal. Mitoma, the substitute, really well-worked move again from Brighton. Arsenal naive, Arsenal caught out. And what was interesting was I counted in the second half um, twice and twice in the first half. Arsenal finding situations or finding themselves in a situation where a Brighton attack of three or four players had completely bypassed the Arsenal midfield and was on to the back line. And it was three against four or four against three or four against four, whatever. That was a worry. And that doesn't happen anywhere near as frequently when Thomas Partey's in the side, when Ben White is at fullback, when, um, you know, Zinchenko plays on the left or when Tierney plays on the left alongside the first teamers. Why? Because there is a much better structure in place and the players are individually well-equipped to deal with those issues and, and therefore do that. But when you make those changes and you put a more traditional fullback in at right-back, for example, that impacts the structure, that impacts the way we morph between our um, offensive and defensive shape. So, yeah, you, you could see all those cracks. And, and, you know, I wasn't surprised in the end when Brighton then got a third through Tarek Lamptey and essentially put the game to bed. The stadium was empty by the time we got to stoppage time. Pretty much everybody was heading for the exits from around about the 80th minute because they didn't believe that Arsenal would find a way back into it either. And that's obviously disappointing to see. Listen, momentum is a big thing. I talk about it a lot and I talk about how much emphasis and value Mikel Arteta puts on that because I really believe he does. But he took a decision last night that I can't quite work out whether it was one born out of disrespect or one born out of just an understanding that this competition is not what we're after this season and is not the priority, but obviously couldn't come out and say, well, I don't care about the Carabao Cup and hence why I've made the changes. So you kind of got to read in between the lines a little bit with some of his reaction. The bit about the squad being short, he talked about that in the press conference. Some of you have mentioned those comments. Yeah, I agree with him. And, and as I said to you guys right at the top of the show, we haven't learned anything that we didn't already know. All that we've had is, is confirmation of what we already believe to be the case, is confirmation of what needs to happen in January, should the club manage it. And uh, hopefully they can, you know, hopefully they can, because if we can and really double down on the, the success that we've had at the start of the season, and we can add those players that are going to keep us at that level and help us remain afloat, then, you know, I'm all for it. But at the same time, we've seen that Arsenal are not the type of side to, to rush into the transfer market now and do a rash deal. That's not what this project is, is built upon or based around. And we're not going to see that, I don't think. I think if you do see Arsenal make moves in January, it'll be moves for players who, 
a they feel are available but have had an eye on already um you know and b players that maybe they're considering bringing on in the summer bringing on board that is in the summer but feel that if they throw a little bit of extra money at it they can get it done in january and that stands us in good stead moving forward so yeah there we are you know it's um it was a frustrating night it was a disappointing night but have i lost sleep over it absolutely not am i stressed about it absolutely not do i do i care about the carabao cup not as much as i probably should i just want arsenal to get back into the champions league that's what this season is all about as i've said to you before this and the FA Cup, the two domestic cups do not offer us a route back to where we ultimately want to be. So how can anybody justify putting them at the top of the pile or anywhere near it? If Arsenal go and beat Wolverhampton Wanderers on Saturday at Molyneux and ensure that we remain in first position going into the World Cup break, nobody can have any complaints about the team that Mikel Arteta picked the other night and nobody will even talk about it. I promise you. So now Arteta needs his players to go out on Saturday and vindicate the decision he took by showing a fresh, vibrant display that then gives us the result that we're looking for. That's how I see it anyway. Um, just another bit from the press conference. I don't know if uh, some of you guys have seen it, the video on Haters TV of the press conference. I spoke to Mikel Arteta after the game. I asked him a little bit about... Uh, Gabriel's disappointment at not being named in the Brazil squad and how Gabby Jesus and, and Gabby Martinelli have kind of been helping him kind of process that disappointment. Everybody else had asked about the game. Everybody else had done that bit, the, the January bit, you know, do you need to strengthen all of that stuff? So I felt that was an interesting question to ask just to find out what the dynamics been a little bit like, uh, what it's been like, uh, or find out a little bit about what it's been like, I beg your pardon, behind the scenes off the back of, you know, two of the two of our Brazilians making it and one of them obviously missing out. It must be quite difficult for him. Um, but Mikel Arteta said that the whole team's been really supportive. And he, he kind of confirmed that Gabriel, in his own mind, knew that there was a, a distinct and, and strong possibility that he wouldn't be in the side. But yeah, look, and, and also the other thing to note about last night as well is that a lot of people couldn't watch the game. The game, as far as I know, wasn't televised in a lot of places. I don't know if there was one stream somewhere because... I mean, I, I I don't know. I didn't check. I wasn't around. I was obviously at the game. But I, I got home last night, right? And um, normally when I get home, I I sort of make myself a hot drink. I, I either sprawl out across the couch or sometimes I get into bed. Last night I got into bed. I was absolutely shattered. And what I'll do is after an Arsenal game is I'll scroll through social media for a bit and, and try and gauge and understand how other people are feeling about the game. I've got my views and opinions, but I think it's quite nice to kind of go through it and, and just kind of gauge where others are at. And sometimes someone will raise a point that you maybe didn't think of or, or didn't consider. And, and that's good as well when you're trying to compile some sort of analysis for a, a podcast or anything like this. And I, I went on to YouTube because I wanted to see um I wanted to see some of the post match stuff. And I saw watch alongs being advertised. How did you do a watch along of a game that nobody could watch? That, that's incredible work. Um, yeah. <laughs> you could have just said um, we did, uh, you know, we we talked through the game or, or we followed the game or whatever. I know the way you title it is important for YouTube and all of that. And listen, I'm not, it's not a big deal. I'm not knocking anyone for it, but it just made me laugh. I was like, watch along, but you didn't even watch it. How have you done a watch along on a game that you didn't watch? How are you telling people what's going on when you can't see it yourself? incredible stuff fair play to those people because that is dedication um i probably would have had another game on the tv and um and stuck the radio on uh chucked on arsenal.com's coverage which i think a lot of people did last night and is obviously very good nowadays with um adrian clark and and um dan roebuck uh of course doing the commentary along with uh, jeremy aliadier uh, last night as well Okay, guys, I think I'm going to leave it there. I don't really want to dwell on this game too much. I don't really want to get caught up in the um, the cycle of negativity that you know some people are trying to generate at the moment and create. We're top of the Premier League. We're out of the competition that I care the least about. It means that our fixture schedule is going to be less congested than it could have been come the second part of the season. And given that not only is this fourth in my priority list, but it's 
fourth by quite some distance. I, I'm kind of glad that we don't have the games. I honestly feel like I'm not glad that we lost. I'm not glad that some of our players didn't perform. You know, that's not um, that's not what I'm saying here. But let's take the positive from the negative. Let's let's take the the good point from a bad evening overall. And the good point is that we're out of a competition that I don't think does an awful lot for us, if I'm being honest. So, yeah, we are where we are. We don't have the squad yet to compete on multiple fronts. I'm concerned as to whether we're even going to be able to compete on a Premier League and Europa League front at an equal kind of level. We haven't done so far this season, so it's going to be interesting to see how we manage that and and whether or not we can bring in reinforcements in January. But is it the be or an end all? No, it's not. It's not the be or an end all. Um, it's disappointing that we lost at home. We've been on a really good run at home for quite some time now. That would have been uh, 13 games on the trot where we'd won at Emirates Stadium had we managed to get, um, you know, the uh, the result last night. But it is what it is. We move and, and we get over it. And all focus turns now to, uh, to Wolverhampton Wanderers coming up on Saturday evening. Now, uh, I, the next bit of content I bring you, and I don't know when I'm going to get a chance to do this because I'm meeting a few friends uh, this evening. So it might be late tonight or it might be tomorrow, but we're going to be reacting to Gareth Southgate's England squad. I wish people would stop spoiling it on Twitter. The whole build up to the announcement is supposed to be exciting, enjoyable. Is he in? Is he not? And instead, you've got people on Twitter telling you, journalists as well, I know what they're doing. They're doing their job and they're trying to get in front of the curve and all of that stuff. Um, which I understand, but come on, like, just save it, man. Save it. You can, you can break it a minute before you'd have to break it from the morning. And now we're all sitting there and like the announcement is not, not a big deal anymore. But anyway, um, okay. Uh, Ben Excel says, is there a 90 min stream this week? There is. We're back tomorrow. We're looking ahead to the weekend's action tomorrow. We'll also be reacting to Gareth Southgate's England squad. Um, and of course, uh, we'll be uh, catching up on some of the news that we missed because we weren't live on Monday, but we are back and we go back to normal. Uh, there'll be a gas tank on Monday to review the final weekend of Premier League action. And then all attention turns to the FIFA World Cup, where we'll be bringing you very regular streams on the 90 Min channel. So I can't wait for that. OK, leave a like on the video if you haven't done so already. Please do subscribe to the channel. If you are new, uh, nowhere near enough likes on the board, by the way, let's try and get 100 by the time the stream ends. Like, 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 subscribe. You know the drill by now. Help us on the road towards 25K here. Uh, big hello to everybody who's joined us late. Don't worry, you can rewind it and I'll speak to you all soon. Up the Arsenal. Goodbye. I'm Martin Tyler and you're listening to Harry Simeon.